Thank you for joining us today, everybody. My name is Biliana Yakula, and I'm one of the program managers for the Therapy Animal Program at Pet Partners. I will be one of your hosts for the day. And I am Lisa Ziner, Evaluator, Instructor, Support Specialist for the Therapy Animal Program. I also have been a handler for 10 years with my dog and four years with a rabbit. In addition, I am a licensed evaluator and instructor. Today, we will cover three different evaluation-related topics. We'll start off by reviewing the skills and attributes an animal needs to be successful at the evaluation and beyond. Next, we will focus on the other end of the leash, the handler, and the skills they should emphasize to prepare for therapy animal work. We will discuss the overall philosophy behind how the pet partner's evaluation is structured, which helps develop a deeper understanding of what we are looking for in prospective teams. Along the way, we will address some common questions first-time handlers have, and we'll wrap up today's session with an overview of what you can expect the day prior to the evaluation and on the day of the event itself. Today we have a mixed audience of prospective handlers as well as current teams who will be going through an evaluation as part of their registration renewal down the road. Whichever of the two categories describes you, the information in this webinar looks at bigger picture skills and considerations which can apply both when you are participating in this process for the first time, as well as if you are looking to continue refining your skills in preparation for renewal evaluation. We have allowed time for questions and answers at the end of our session. Feel free to submit questions as they come to mind, and those will be addressed once we wrap up the core materials we have prepared for you today. We have also infused a little humor in our presentation and thank the internet for the images over which we can claim no ownership. Today, we won't actually be discussing the evaluation exercises in detail. If you would like to know the exact exercises which you will need to perform for the species of animal you are registering with, please log in to the Volunteer Center via our website, click on the resource library from the menu on the right, and type Evaluation Overview in the search box. Please note that you're, if you're planning on registering with a very small dog whom you wish to carry for a portion of the evaluation, you should select the evaluation overview for small dogs. The reason why today we will not be discussing each exercise in detail is because the overview document is very detailed, but also because we don't feel that teaching to the test, so to speak, is the best way to prepare you for an evaluation or the subsequent visiting and future interactions you will face. We instead would like, would ask for you to first look at your animal through the eyes of the public what do they see? Does your animal appear controllable, reliable, and predictable, even in a chaotic setting such as a children's soccer game? If so, then you probably have a very good start, and all you need to do is focus on honing and supporting those skills, which is what our webinar will cover today. We hope that by showing you what we look for and why, you will be able to, in turn, present a team to our evaluators which they will happily and confidently pass. We often get asked the question of, how do I know if my animal is right for this type of work? Or how do I select the right animal to adopt if I want them to become part of the therapy animal program down the road? Pet Partners believes that the elements that make a successful therapy animal are both innate in terms of personality and disposition, as well as taught, such as basic skills. An animal who is a good candidate for our program should also be supported by a handler who reads their body language very well and advocates and educates clients on how to best approach and interact with their animal. To make a good team and have the best success in an evaluation, a team needs to work on all three elements. We will discuss each of these topics in more detail over the next slides. By understanding these elements, you'll be able to develop your own strategy for preparing for the evaluation. The first and truly key element to successful volunteerism as a therapy animal team is the animal's disposition. Animals who are a good fit for this type of work sincerely enjoy and seek out interactions with strangers and have a calm demeanor when facing the world. Exercises on the pet partner's evaluation are geared toward assessing if the animal being evaluated truly seems to seek out interaction. Some animals, just like some humans, are simply born with such a personality. This is why it is absolutely possible to adopt an eight-year-old dog from the shelter whose prior history you know nothing about and realize 
that regardless of the socialization she may or may not have had in the past, this pup has an amazing personality that everyone immediately recognizes. Some animals' personality is more middle of the road, so to speak, and with encouragement, socialization, and plenty of fun and positive experiences, that personality can be given the opportunity to blossom into truly the right disposition. But not all middle-of-the-road personalities will quite follow that journey. Sometimes a person will adopt an animal, do plenty of training and socialization, and a year later step back and assess appropriateness for therapy animal work, and the conclusion may be that Sparky still doesn't quite enjoy volunteerism. That is quite all right. Sparky is allowed to have that personality. And the time that you spent together training and socializing is absolutely not wasted. You have become closer along the way, developed better communication and more trust than you would have had if you didn't do this work. And hopefully had a lot of fun as well. So training and socializing is its own reward regardless of where you take that to next. While we usually agree that therapy animals have special attributes different from those of the average cat or rabbit or rat, it is our experience that these special attributes or disposition can be much harder to discern when it comes to dogs. Perhaps it is because we are all exposed to them in some way from birth, and honestly, many enjoy some of the quirkiness of our dogs being dogs behavior, such as a dog being overly protective of their handler or the handler's children or grandchildren when they're walking in the park. But such protection tendencies would not be acceptable for a therapy animal who may see the child they're visiting as one of the children they should protect. And when the child cries out getting a shot, the dog growls at the nurse who is administering it. Resource guarding is another such topic. In addition to people, dogs may guard toys or food. A therapy dog can't be a resource guarder of food, toys, the handler, or client. Think of this scenario. If a dog does pick up a child's stuffed animal because it looks just like their own toy at home, they will still need to rapidly drop it with zero objection. Think about how your pup reacts when he comes across other animals. Dogs are such an integral part of our lives that we know whenever we are out, we will more than likely come across another dog or even a cat or a rabbit. A therapy dog or another species of therapy animal should easily or with minimal direction accept the other species without overly aggressive behavior or att of attempting to meet or interact with that other animal. So what happens if your dog is reactive and you've been told not to worry, it can be trained away? If an animal, in this case a dog, has ha some propensity to respond to stress or unknown stimuli with growls, lunges, bearing of teeth, then our program is not a good fit for them please take a moment and reconsider before signing up to attend an evaluation. A portion of handlers and more dog trainers than we want to count have claimed, given enough training, I will teach that dog not to growl at other animals. Let's discuss this for a moment. Frequently an animal resorts to reactive behaviors because they are experiencing stress. Or maybe they not, do not fully understand or are not feeling fully supported to deal with what is happening around them. These animals have learned their more aggressive behavior is the way to make the stressor go away. By attending training, in a portion of cases, you may be able to teach yourself and your animal additional skills on how to manage the stress and skill for the animal to listen to you, the handler, for guidance on how to remove yourselves from the stressful situation. But will this work 100% of the time? And would you be able to proactively know 100% of the t time if the training failed or was put aside for a more dramatic response before the animal acted out? Not necessarily. All it might take is the perfect storm of your animal being tired, hot, in some discomfort from early stages of arthritis, and a toddler who suddenly squeals behind their back, and the training may get tossed aside for that instance in favor of the more dramatic self-defense action that your animal used to resort to regularly and they know is effective. Or you, the handler, may even be the cause. If, at one -year -old, if your one-year-old pup, Jax, was attacked by a big brown dog, and now, months later, you look up and see a big brown dog coming your way, it could be the anxiety you send down the leash that will be the trigger for Jax to revert back to the pre previous reactivity. So now you have a barking, pulling dog going after what they perceive as a threat, perhaps not to them, but to you. In addition to worrying about your dog's stress, now you also have to worry about your own. 
you need to become hyper vigilant because the facility now allows families to bring their pets and you have no idea who or what you may meet when you go there to visit. Is that kind of stress something you really want to take on? If every time your dog sees another dog, there is potential for barking or growling, the handler must now be on high alert to ensure their team is not placed in a situation where the dog will act out. And if the handler fails to be proactive, we now have an incident, possibly a traumatized client, and worst of all, the potential to lose a program opportunity, all because one handler chose to take a dog they knew was reactive and put them in the very situation where they would act out. On another end of the spectrum, we have the shy withdrawn animal. Many handlers have shared with us that in anticipation of their upcoming evaluation, they have been practicing extra socialization and believe by the time the evaluation comes up, their animal will no longer be anxious, shy, or withdrawn around strangers. For the animals we mentioned on the previous slide, the middle of the road personality, socialization may absolutely un unlock the doors to wonderful enjoyment of the world of strangers. Some other animals will always be shy and might never enjoy or only ever just tolerate for the sake of their handlers interacting with strangers. In such cases, training and socialization may teach the animal how not to actually pull away from the stranger, but on the inside, they are still not enjoying the interaction and feeling stress over it. Think of it in terms of human personalities. An introvert can learn how to be the charming host of a work function, but that will likely take more conscientious effort and possibly plenty of stress on their part than it would for an extrovert. Regardless of whether this leads to a path of volunteerism, it is important to give socialization opportunities for your animal. This is not about exposing them to every type of person or situation you can. Rather, it is taking your animal out into controlled social situations at first, supporting them through pets and yayaba, which in turn allows for them to choose to interact or not. When an animal is given a choice to approach or not, and given a choice to consent to petting or not, they have more control over their world and are better able to handle social situations such as a crowd or an upset client. One thing to be aware of when socializing your animal is to look for and understand the difference between an animal wishing to please their handler and an animal genuinely wishing to interact with most folks they encounter. Obviously, we want to see a strong bond between the handler and animal, but we also want to be sure the animal is doing this type of volunteerism because they genuinely love people. We hear all the time, I take my animal with me everywhere and they love it. Sometimes we ask the question, do they really? Of course, some may, but there are countless others who do not like to be put in a car only to be driven around all day, being taken in and out of businesses and seeing all sorts of people all wanting to get into their space and pet them. So socialize, socializing is not about taking your animal everywhere. It is about making sure that the places you do take your animal, the animal feels supported and the interactions only last for as long as the animal is having a pleasant time and no longer. In addition to assessing for having the right but the disposition, the pet partner's evaluation exercises will test for specific obedience skills. Therapy animals are required to only have basic obedience skills in order to register with pet partners. That being said, it is important to practice these skills ahead of time so when you attend the evaluation, commands like sit, stay, and the ability to leave it are very well rehearsed. A well-skilled team where an animal responds to cues the first time they are asked will provide confidence to the facility as well as the clients. Why are some of these skills important? Let's take a couple of the less obvious skills as examples. Maybe you'll plan on register with a small dog, a four pound Yorkie, who of course will always be on a leash when visiting and will be carried a good portion of the time. Why should your Lola have to demonstrate the skill of stay? Think of this scenario. You're walking down the hallway of a nursing home and a client bumps into you with their walker and stubs your toe. For a brief moment, you are actually in pain and out of instinct, you set Lola down in the process without realizing it, let go of the leech and reach for your foot because you're worried your little toe may actually be broken. Of course, we don't want such a scenario to happen to you, but if it does, we want to be confident that Lola won't panic and run away. What about the leave it command? Maybe you and Max plan to visit at schools. 
you show up right at the end of recess and a very young child, realistically the size of Max, has a half-eaten cookie in his hand. We want Max to be relied on not to snatch the cookie out of the child's hand. Some handlers come to an evaluation with the idea that their animal is the one who is about to be evaluated and thus they should focus exclusively on their animal's skill. This is actually not accurate. Much of the evaluation assesses the animals, the human skill as well, in addition to the animals. It is crucial for the handler to have a strong ability to read the body language of their animal. Body language is, of course, species specific. It may also be partly unique to your individual animal. To be successful at the evaluation and when visiting as a volunteer, a handler needs to be able to recognize both signals of stress as well as of enjoyment. The simple principle is, do less of what produces signals of stress in your animal and more of what produces signals of enjoyment. Additionally, an advanced handler is able to recognize more subtle, earlier signals of stress building up, such as the stiffening of an animal's body, rather than rely only on the obvious signs, such as growling, which come once the stress has been building up for some time. If you are considering registering with a dog, and would like to learn more about body language, we invite you to take our canine body language class. Simply look it up under the Learn tab on our main website. We just briefly touched on consent a few slides ago, so let's look at that concept a little closer. Consent is one of the elements which should always be present during an action therapy animals have with members of the public. This is also something that the evaluator will be looking for during the evaluation appointment itself. The questions to ask yourself is, does your animal look like they want to be there? Does he or she welcome interaction with the evaluator and the volunteers? Your best tool with respect to this aspect of the evaluation is a very strong bond with your animal and very accurate read of their body language. Do you know what your animal's ears, eyes, tail, etc., look like when they are stressed? Are you playing, paying close enough attention to notice when subtle changes start to take place and intervene? Does your animal look willing to interact with clients and seek it out, or do they always wait until you give the command, and then when you do, they do to interact, they are looking for your affirmation, not the client's. Understanding the difference is a key element of advocating for your animal and the concept of ya ya ba. You are not quite familiar with consent and want to learn more about this topic that applies to your animal and to check for consent when your animal is interacting with you or clients, feel free to view our consent webinar recording in the resource library of the Volunteer Center. This photo is one of Billy Anna's dogs, Julie, very happily consenting to the playful interaction of the moment. During the evaluation, you will be expected to advocate for your animal. The evaluation appointment is a role play between the handler and evaluator and mimics what would happen on an actual visit. It is appropriate and encouraged for a handler to, for example, give guidance to the evaluator about how Max likes to be petted during the clumsy petting exercise. A statement such as, Max doesn't like his tail touched, but definitely enjoys being petted on his chest, is a subtle example of advocating for your animal. Once you are a registered team, you would be expected to engage in advocacy during every visit. So practice the skill of speaking up on behalf of your animal so you're comfortable with drawing some boundaries. Once you're registered, you will likely find yourself advocating for your animal in a lot of settings. If a client is petting Max in a way which is too rough, if a facility wants Max to do a two hour visit in the sun where you know he will be uncomfortable, with a visitor of a client who asks you to take Max off leash, off leash so that she can throw a frisbee for him in the enclosed facility yard. Advocacy and education, especially about Max, his likes and dislikes, presented in an appropriate and professional manner, is a skill which will serve you and Max very well on every single visit and throughout your shared time together. A small portion of the evaluation itself, but a big portion of volunteerism, calls for the handler to educate. During the evaluation and on visit, you will need to educate others how to approach your animal for maximum comfort and how to give a treat, for example. Once you are a registered pet partner's team, 
you will need to be as comfortable educating others about what therapy animal work is about, as well as model responsible pet ownership behaviors. This is not necessarily easy for some people to verbalize and teach to others, even if it is very easy for them to put in practice. So practice the skill of educating. It will serve you well on evaluation day and beyond. We covered a lot of ground. Let's take a moment and recap the skills teams should practice in preparation for an evaluation. With respect to the animal, you should practice socialization and basic obedience skills such as sit and stay. The human should practice reading body language, discerning consent, advocating for their animal, and educating clients. So you have worked with your animal on their obedience skills and their socialization. You have taken them out in the public and practiced everything you can think of, from making sure you're using acceptable equipment and your animal is very comfortable with it, to taking your cat to a parking garage in your city and practicing going up and down an elevator. While you were out exploring the world, you also allowed people to interact with your cat. During these interactions, you were able to see the f that, in fact, your cat does seem to like most people, especially older women. When Kitty sees people she particularly likes, she purrs and seems to seek out the interaction and always consents to petting, actually rubbing on strangers, seeking out more when the interaction ends, but without being pushy or overbearing. You feel confident your animal is indeed appropriate for this type of work. You have taken the handler course as well, and you're ready to attend an evaluation. Let's talk about what to focus on the day prior to an evaluation, as well as on the day of the event. On the day before your evaluation appointment, just like with any other important appointments you may have, confirm the basics. What will the weather be like tomorrow? If it's expected to snow or be stormy, perhaps allow extra time to reach the event. Is there any road work on your way to the event? The more homework you do in preparation for this, the quicker the drive to the evaluation will be, which will be easier on your animal. Don't forget that stress travels down the leash. If you are stressed out on the day of the evaluation, your animal will pick, on, uh, pick up on that and not perform their best. So both of you are not set up, or so both of you are, need to be set up for success by being prepared. Get your equipment ready. Make sure the leash and collar or harness you plan on using are clean and in good shape. You have prepared a brush, treats, and any other applicable items. Have extra water, paper towels, and waste bag with you, just so that's one less thing to think about. Be sure to have completed your handler questionnaire. Your evaluator will need to review that prior to the start of the exercises. Do you have your rabies certificate for your animal? If rabies vaccines is required for your species, ideally bring along the certificate Otherwise, bringing along a completed animal health screening form signed and dated by your vet is also acceptable as rabies information is mentioned on the form itself. Get a good night's sleep and start the next day with a positive attitude. It's evaluation day. Congratulations. Of course, we will always encourage you not to be late to your appointment. There is very detailed planning and sequencing of teams that goes on ahead of time so swapping spots with another handler or expecting that there will be enough free time between evaluations to squeeze you in if you are late is not realistic. At the same time, we would like to caution you against arriving too early. If you are at your evaluation site one hour prior to your time slot, for example, needing to wait for so long might increase your animal's stress level. This will put you at a disadvantage when your slot comes up and may lead to a a lower rating than you would normally receive, or even a not ready rating. If you are evaluating with more than one animal, or if your animal is evaluating with you and another handler, these special circumstances should have been addressed with your evaluator ahead of time. Please never ever arrive at the evaluation with an extra animal or human wh whom you expect to get evaluated, but about whom you haven't spoken with the evaluator. If you're going to need an extra animal or extra human evaluation on the same day, please converse ahead of time with the evaluator how those should be timed. Sometimes the recommendation may be that they are done back to back. At other times, there may be another team in between. Much depends on the dynamics of who the other teams are. 
So your evaluation is over, your team passed. Congratulations. Your evaluator will provide some feedback about your team's performance, and you will, they will give you a six-page document which contains your scoring for each of the exercises. Those are your evaluation score sheets, an important document we want you to hold on to. What happens next? At your next availability, scan all six pages into one document and upload it to your online registration so Pet Partner staff can review and approve it. Please remember that an evaluation is a key step in the registration process, but it is not the final step. You are considered registered only after receiving Pet Partner's acceptance letter. The information contained on the score sheet is also useful feedback to you as the handler as it describes your team performance. Read to the details and think back to how each of the exercises went from your point of view. First order of business is to celebrate your team's success. What is also very helpful is to use the scores to identify areas for continued improvement and growth. Even if you are not planning to evaluate sooner than the two-year mark when your team would be renewing, it's never too early to formulate a plan for what to work on next. While this is not a series of webinars, next month we will offer a second presentation which will focus on additional aspects of the evaluation experience. The Evaluation Masterclass will focus on detailed circumstances, so, uh, specific circumstances such as evaluating as a team which has lapsed, evaluating for a new rating or new equipment, evaluating for a potential different rating, as well as the youth endorsement evaluation. The session will be open to prospective handlers as well, but be prepared to come in with solid understanding of the basic evaluation process as we will not be focusing on that topic. We hope to see many of you during that session as well. And with this, we have wrapped up our content for the day. We would like to now open the floor for questions and any input that you would like to share with us. And actually, we see that we have a couple of questions and comments that have already come up. Um, we have a question from um, a graduate student studying mental health counseling um, and obtaining a certification in AAT. The question is, is there a specific evaluation for individuals looking to register their animal for one-on-one -on -one therapy and animal work, but not intending um, to register to go volunteer within hospitals? So um, the answer to that one is that um, we don't have a separate um, evaluation for that, separate registration process for that. All of our teams who register with pet partners are expected to be volunteers when they're out on visits. But we do have a portion of professionals such as mental health counselors who, even though they're not actually intending to very frequently, um, sometimes literally once or twice a year um, only, go out volunteering in the community, they, they are intending to bring their animal into their work. Um, sometimes they choose to go through our process, registration process, simply as practice, um, as well as for added um, assurance that they are, um, as a team, um, performing solidly. In those cases, um, their work will not be considered pet partners' visits and not be covered by pet partners' insurance since they're getting paid for the work that they're doing. And in those cases, obviously, also pet partners' policies and procedures will not apply. So the answer is, no, we don't have a specific evaluation, but yes, we still have plenty of professionals that go, do go through the process um, because this gives them um, an extra opportunity to practice different skills and get assessed on those skills. Liliana, would you like me to take the next two? Go ahead, thank you. Um, the next question is, is the test specific to the environment or type of facility that a team would like to volunteer in? What we do is we, our evaluators, will role play a facility, usually a facility that will require all the skills we need for the evaluation exercises. So in most cases, it's going to be an assisted living facility, it's going to be a hospital or some kind of convalescent care. But no, it won't be actually specific. If you wanted to go to a hospital when you walk in, the evaluation won't be set up as a hospital. Um, or if you wanted to go to a school, we wouldn't set it up in you know, an environment that would look like a classroom. Um, the next thing is, um, this comes from one of our evaluators, thank you for attending, and they point out it's important to have your advocacy skills practiced. Knowing how to redirect or explain to the person visiting your pet what to do should be practiced. And she is right, because you need to be able to do, demonstrate that during the team evaluation. 
we have had a couple of comments from people following um, an evaluation that they attended that they didn't quite feel comfortable speaking up or redirecting the evaluator that it felt like they would be interfering with the job that the evaluator is doing um, it's actually not like that please feel empowered to speak up for your animal um, we are looking for that that actually will earn new points that is going to be a, a good positive thing uh, to demonstrate to us for sure so um, um, feel feel free to to do so and also the the um, evaluator should give you clues and if you were doing something wrong they should you know they'll be able to redirect you but Delana is right we are looking throughout the evaluation for you to be educating and advocating and the the, the better job that's done you know the um, more successful you will be well, we have um, more questions um, coming in. I wanted to remind um, everyone to please use the contact us form on our website. Um, if you have any additional questions following this webinar, we realize we might not answer every question that comes up today. Um, well, certainly it is possible that um, after the webinar wraps up, you think of something else that you had a question about. Just go to our website, use the contact us form and submit your inquiry. We will be more than happy to help you out with that um, and provide additional clarification. A recording of this webinar will be made available within our resource library um, in about um, a week or two so that you can come back and view the webinar again and, and go over the materials that we covered today. Any questions that you would like us to answer right now, please go ahead and submit. We do have a few more minutes. All right, what should you do if the evaluator tells you to remove the harness you have practiced with that is um, on the approved list? I think um, I'll let Lisa um, answer that particular question. I probably would need a little more details as to why they were asking you to um, remove the harness. My best advice would be probably to ask them, that, that, let's go ahead and double check the acceptable equipment list. That way the both of you can look at the list and make a determination at that point. Um, but as long as it's on the list, it, it, there shouldn't be an issue. Absolutely. Um, we do um, do ongoing um, education to our team evaluators um, about um, current policies and procedures, most updated of the materials that we have, webinars, um, newsletters, a lot of different information to ensure everybody has access to the most up-to-date information um, so that they can access it both prior to an event as well as in many cases during an event. There have been times where at the start of an evaluation, um, a team and an evaluator um, have a have a conversation and come up with something that they actually want to look up in that moment um, on the pet partners website or in the resource library and they're able to do so in the moment so we take um, significant steps to to ensure everybody has access to the right materials um, we have a question as to where whether there will be a link to share this webinar. Um, there, the recording itself will be in the resource library, so anybody who um, wants to view it will be able to um, to do so directly. Um, Felice may be able to separately send out um, a link option as well. well. It looks like one of our um, another one of our wonderful evaluators are on today, and they also pointed out as a reminder, and they are right that while you are advocating for your animal through the evaluation and um, attempting to redirect, the evaluator is still going to do what they need to do. For example, um, if you don't feel your animal really cares for hugs, we're still going to have to do the hug. You may, have, you may guide and direct that um, interaction, but it's still going to happen. That's a great point. Um, uh, the exercises are, are mandatory, um, some providing guidance um, to the evaluator as to how your animal would prefer that those, those happen um, is, is a positive thing, but we can't guide away <laughs> from a, a mandatory exercise. That's, that's a very good point. Um, can treats be used during the test for rewarding good behavior? Go ahead, Lisa. The only time a treat is allowed is at the very end where we offer, where the evaluator will offer a treat to your animal. But during the exercises, no treats are going to be allowed. Um, the animal will have to be resp respond purely by your commands. How the you, next uh, your animal takes the treat from the evaluator, sorry to interrupt, um, is actually going to also um, be um, evaluated on, um, be assessed. 
And you do have the um, option of declining the treat, but we will tell you that the evaluator is still going to have the treat in their hand in front of the dog because we're also not only assessing for how nicely the animal will take the treat, but if there's any kind of food aggression issues, such as once the treat's in the hand, is the dog going to jump up? You know, is, uh, it, has the animal become very hyper-focused and, you know, attempting to get to that treat even though it's been declined? Great point. Um, so we had a question about some logistics, if there is a fee for the evaluation, and is the fee the same um, for each attempt? Um, so this is the fee that the evaluators do charge, um, which most of them do, um, is for the purposes of covering the expenses of putting together the evaluation. Our evaluators are volunteers, so they don't charge for their actual time um, performing the evaluation, but there may be rent for the facility where they're performing the evaluation and the like, so they're allowed to be compensated for that. Um, so depending on what kind of costs the evaluator incurred, the facility, uh, the fee for the evaluation will vary. Um, we see an average of about $20 to $25, um, and it's going to um, depend on simply the, the same day. So if it's at the same facility with the same overall expenses, it's most likely going to be the same from, time, from one evaluation session to another put together by the same evaluator. Um, but if you're looking at a different state that you happen to move to, it may certainly look different. All right. Um, any final questions um, uh, while we are waiting for those? Because we have three more minutes of our time today together. I did want to also remind um, and mention that at the end of this webinar, there will be a quick survey regarding your experience today. We would very much appreciate your input um, about the best parts of the webinar, the parts parts of the webinar that you wish we had spent less time on, as well as any other topics that you would like us to cover down the road. We most definitely look at this input um, and use it to inform our additional sessions for them down, down the road, or if a session, another session of this particular webinar will be held again um, to give us opportunity to refine the content that we are presenting to you. So we would greatly appreciate it if you would take the survey. doesn't seem like there are additional questions at this point. Um, as mentioned, if for an overview of what the specific evaluation exercises are that you would need to prepare for, please go to the resource library and type in evaluation overview. You will have very detailed documents that you will be able to access um, in order to review the specific exercises. Today's webinar presents the key um, key skills that truly will help you be successful at those exercises. And um, it is ideally going to be used in conjunction with the evaluation overview document that you can find in the resource library. And today, um, Felice has very nicely, um, has two handouts. It's the evaluation overview for large dogs and the evaluation overview for small dogs. That is fantastic. Um, we do register nine different species, but about 94% of our teams are dog teams. Um, so we wanted to um, make um, make that available. That is that is a great addition. Thank you, Felice. All right, and if there are no further questions at this time, um, we have another minute or so left. We want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of your day and wonderful rest of your week. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at other sessions of webinars that we host down the road. Thank you so much for attending.